peep rotation. There's nothing more frustrating than pulling your bow back on a nice buck only to not be able to see your pins clearly because your peep is rotated. This is something that I've personally experienced in the field and know Chris and Rick both have as well. In order to reduce this risk, we only pick high quality bowstrings to put on our bows. That is why this season we have partnered up with Hooked Up Bowstrings. If you are looking for a high quality string to help get you through the season, look no further than Hooked Up. Matt, the owner, is a fantastic guy. He is an accomplished competition archer and an accomplished hunter in the woods. You can visit his website at hookedupbowstrings.com. Use the code MOBILEHUNTER10. That's mobile hunter, the number 10, in order to get 10% off your order. Hey guys, Rick here from the Mobile Hunter Podcast, and I'm here to tell you about one of our sponsors, Saddies LLC, Custom Ammunition and Gun Works. Aaron Satterfield and his family have been turning out some awesome game loads that have been putting down deer, waterfowl, and turkey all year long. The Saddies Fatty, the turkey load that we use, can stop a bird dead in its tracks. Check them out at saddiesllc.com. That's S A T T I E S L L C.com or on Facebook at Saddies LLC and tell them the Mobile Hunter Podcast sent you. Welcome to the Mobile Hunter Podcast. Our mission is simple we want to help you become a better hunter. We believe that mobility kills and efficiency will set you free. If you're hearing that, it's the sound of another Wild Calling Wednesday. We got another awesome Deer Camp esque story with a really good friend of mine, Drake Deerman. Actually, Drake, you and I just met this year at the Southern Mobile Hunters Expo. And uh, we shared a couple drinks, shared a couple brewskis back then, <laughs> told some stories. And uh, I just knew right away that you were a class act guy that uh, really liked to get after it. And what we're going to be talking about today is the story of an absolute freaking slammer on public land in Kentucky. And dude, I am I am jacked up, man. How are you doing today, Drake? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing real good after last week. <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh my gosh. This thing is a monster. I'm gonna have to to put it in the thumbnail, guys. But this what'd you say? It was like one sixty six? Uh one sixty six or well we okay, I got it at one sixty six on the head, but once we got it off the you know, got the skull cap, uh we got it at one sixty four twice. I actually have it right here sitting beside me if you want me to. Oh, hold that up. Hold that bad boy up, dude. Oh, my God. You can't even get it in frame. That is so cool, man. So, God, what a stud. Dude, I have a buck. I'll have to show you a video after this, but I had a buck that was I that bedded down, um, and I got a stalk on in Nebraska, and I was sitting 50 yards from this thing bedded, and a side by side came off of the private and onto the public and jumped him and screwed up. Dude, I and he was dripping blood and velvet and ugh. It's gonna be great footage when it comes out. But but dude, what a stud. That is just man, I can't wait to get into this. But uh I wanna give some people you said this is your first podcast ever, so I wanna give people a bit of a background on who you are. Um I'll do some bragging on you, but but you first just talk about like where you're from, what you do. And uh, where you're at with hunting? Uh, so I live in kind of northeast Alabama. Uh, okay. I grew up hunting here. Uh, family's got a farm right outside of town. Uh, that's kind of where I got you know started with it. And my my dad is a. I mean he he kills pretty good deer around here on you know the private we have and. I mean, I was always, I wanted to chase big deer. I was, I never really had a, like one of those phases where you just go out and kill a lot of deer. Uh, ended up after high school, starting to mess around on public land and kind of got off the private stuff. I just, I really like the public land. Uh, we got 200,000 acres of public right here around my house. It's all it's like the far Southern tip of the Appalachian mountains. Uh, and that's where I really kind of, kicked off on the public thing uh i work for myself uh i do construction work lay floor and tile that way when it gets to be it gets to be september through about january i can take off and go uh you know i've hunted ever since i was in high school in the midwest and just 
always had this crazy thing for hunting deer. That's that's what I love to do. That's what I live for. That is awesome, man. I got a buddy that works in concrete that just works seventy two hour weeks in the in the off season and then takes off three months at a time, uh, when he can and when he wants to, uh, for deer hunting and just travels a lot. And it just seems like the life I got another that's Wyatt and then I got a friend Reed Smith that uh Reed uh is a firefighter. So I think he gets like three days off at a time, works the rest, and he just gets out and gets active with it too. And like as a young dude, like it's good money, it's busy work, it's tough work. Um, but when it comes time to go hunting, dude, you can just freaking hit that pavement and chase deer around. And that is just, that's a free feeling. I bet, man. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's still not, you know, easy because there's a lot of stuff you got to take care of and you got to, uh, I mean, I'm still pretty new as far as working for myself. Uh, this is my second hunting season doing it. Uh, and it's, I mean, it is paying off. I mean, I had my best year I've ever had last year and then, I, mean, I kicked this year off pretty good so just i mean it's, it's still not easy but there is there is a you can tell a difference when you can stay oh yeah schedule. yeah yeah absolutely man and then and, you know, there's responsibility and everything too and and um there's only going to be more coming towards guys of our age when we're getting wives and having kids and all that too is going to be uh i don't know if you do have kids or anything like that i assume you don't uh, but- I, I live in about a, this is probably a 600 square foot barn dominium by myself. I got a living room and I got a bathroom and I got a little bedroom. And oh, dude, that is, that is all you freaking need. That and like somewhere to have a campfire indoors or a stove, maybe if you're lucky. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> or yeah. microwave. Kitchen area right there. It's, uh, it's not very big, not much room for a whole lot, but yeah. it's got a microwave. That's where most of my food comes from. There we go. Man, that is, that's freaking life right there man just wow and and your wall behind you really should give people a bit of a look at your wall dude because i was like i was like yeah so this has got to be your dad's house right like jeez, uh, dude let's see so here's a lot of these deer from alabama and then i guess i can walk around uh, a couple of them are from missouri up until up until that deer that was my biggest he was wow. like right at one 52 i think and then this is one i killed last year here's my number one hit lister last year at home in the mountains uh shot this deer last year opening day in Jesus. the mountains and then got some sheds and let's see dude that's just, freaking awesome like, holy crap you're okay, a big time I'm, shed hunter huh uh shed hunting i would probably rather go scouting and uh looking for sheds and doing that kind of stuff as much as I would sitting in a tree. That's my, that's really my thing. Yeah. Well, you get to do so much learning, um, during that period too. That's what's so nice is is you just get to explore and and like we've been talking about, just be freaking wild and, and learn as much as you can. And that's just, that's beautiful, especially at the age when you can do all that walk and you don't mind it and stuff. That's, People always tell me, oh, you're going to get old one day and you're not going to be able to do this. And I'm like, that's damn true. And that's why I'm going to do it as much as I can right now. So, yeah, there's man, no well, doubt. We've got, we got to eat it up while we can because, I mean, they're right. There's going to be a day where we can't. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it sounds like your story is going to tie perfectly into that. Uh, we've given a little bit of your background. Um, we actually met partially through being pro staff for Osseo. Um, and so, you know, we we had short conversations, but I could tell right away, you know, you're a stand up hard working dude and and uh it's cool to see other guys our age, you know, and, and under thirty we'll say at this point in the game, uh being as intense and caring as much about the right things in the outdoors, not just putting antlers on the wall, but about the hard work and things like that. Um so you know, immediately you were a dude I wanted to be friends with and I'm just really happy to have seen you shoot this deer and and, you know, kick off your season in this way. Uh Give us a bit of background on, you know, how far, you don't have to give us like a, di- a direct hours, but this was an out-of-state trip for you. So are you traveling a long way to get to this hunt? Semi. Uh, it's about six hours from my house. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's a pretty good drive, but close enough where I can make some off-season trips, you know, 
scout mm-hmm. and I made two, I made a trip in March. Uh, now I made a trip in July and then the hunt. Gotcha. Yeah. So it sounded like you had done some prep from this, especially since you, you were saying that you'd done some spring scouting. Did you have any particular deer that you had located in that area that you're kind of going after at this point leading into this season? I did. Uh, I, I found a deer, so I found some sign off of a buck in, uh, March, just some big sign, kind of a bedroom, you know, really tight core area kind of deal where, you know, it was, everything was really honed in and outside of there, there was not much sign. And I, I thought this buck would kind of be a homebody, uh, go back in July and it's a standing cornfield button up to where he was at. And I just, I just parked and glassed and actually found, saw the buck with my eyes the first time I ever laid out or first time I come across him, uh, went back the next day, watched him bed down or watched him go to bed and slipped in around him and got a couple cameras up just to see how, you know, how regular he was or whatever. Well, just clockwork. I mean, he had a, he had a loop he was making and I felt like I kind of had timed up what the, you know, when he was getting there and why he was getting there. Uh, I mean, he was daylighting, and right before the season, this wave of people comes in. I mean, this was the most pressured public I've ever hunted, uh, most I've ever dealt with people ever, and he got pushed out uh, about two days before the season started. Yeah, it kind of seems like that on pressured areas that everyone talks about the shift and their deer disappearing and stuff, and it really seems like that shift more happens due to pressure and nature of this particular buck than it does – because a food source, like a lot of people think it's, you know, they shift because they're food source, but I don't think it's quite as drastic as the way that they shift due to pressure, especially in a more pressured area. Do you think about like what a shift looks like from a food source standpoint? Is it, if every deer shifted because of the food source, there would be a migration of deer, you know, and I'm sure in some areas you see that, but uh, I, I do really commonly see that kind of shift due to pressure. Um, so man, I mean, like you're on this buck, is, is he consistent on your cameras on a food pattern is he consistent on a bed pattern or just the whole circuit between food and bed really the time that i would catch him in was one of two reasons coming into the bed and area or if he was already in the bed and area going to get water uh so you had him right where you wanted him to be like right where you wanted to target him Yes. So there wasn't a water source in front of my camera where he was bedding was probably 50 yards in front of my camera. And then I had a water source right behind me and he'd come in, spend two or three days and leave. Uh, He'd be gone for four or five days and then he'd come back, spend two or three days and leave. Uh, And there were some, there were some things as far as weather and, you know, I I felt like I was pretty, I, I knew why he was coming in there when he was coming in there. I mean, who knows? Maybe I was a million miles off, but I felt I felt pretty confident. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about as that's about as freaking dialed as you can get sometimes on these these big bucks. I mean, like two a couple days in a row is I almost never see that. And and that cyclical pattern, if they do spend a few days in an area, if they are consistent day to day, it usually for me, and it's different in a lot of areas, but it's usually for me like maybe two days, maybe three days. Or there's some days you don't get him on camera in the middle, but he shows up on either end of that cycle. And you're like, all right, he's there. You know, he's not just showing up on this particular day for whatever reason. Um, But yeah, I mean, it sounded like you were all over that deer. How does that deer compare to the one you ended up shooting? He he was bigger. Really? Holy crap. All right. So the coordinates to this, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, let's, let's Let's put him on here. Right, right. Like if you, if you had to give us, like if you were as old as the North and West coordinates of that, how old would you be? I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That being a bigger buck, I'm not going to, we'll, we'll go into absolutely no specifics, especially because this is a pressured area. Um, but man, that's (laughs) now I can't wait for next year (laughs) for you. (laughs) That's awesome, man. Hopefully he returns that cycle and, and you can just keep people out of there. You can just, you know, throw a party in the parking lot and make people think there's 40 people there. Park some yeah. beaters in there all off season, you know, and you'd be good yeah. to go. Yeah. That's what yeah, that, it'll take. It'll take something. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Right. Man, that's cool. Um, well, it's sad that that buck busted off and that he was bigger by somehow. 
um, which <laughs> these are freaking giant deer for Kentucky. And I've seen some really good bucks this year come out of Kentucky. Um, so I'll shut up about that. But like, and dude, blown away by this. But so that deer gets blown out. Um, what's your immediate feeling? Now, you know, this deer's gone, right? Like, are you one of those guys that gets discouraged that immediately gets back after it, that kind of step back and reassess? Like what, what was your approach here? Knowing that that buck you were really after is gone. Uh, so I'll be honest with you. I had a, I had a pretty bad obsession with this deer. Uh, I spent four days daylight to dark looking for this deer. Uh, I was kind of scouting the outskirts of what I thought maybe his home range would be, uh, looking for kind of, you know, I guess like obscure bedding that he could be in something that people might not have gone into, uh, you know, scouting the fringes and then glassing in the afternoons. Uh, I never, I never got discouraged and like tucked my tail. I just, I just kept looking and kept looking. And finally after four days, pretty much daylight to dark, uh, I was just like, okay, I can't spend this whole time looking for this one deer. There, there are other, you know, there's another deer out there. So I've got to figure out what, you know, what I got to do. So pretty much what I did was I got in my truck and drove off of the property where I was just looking at something different. And I sat down and I got my Bible out and I, I read it and I prayed and I did everything I could do to not think about deer just try to completely reset uh after you know a few hours of just getting away uh i tried to just kind of start over and start fresh i said okay i'm just going to treat this place as if, I, as if i've never been on it uh i felt like in my time you know i kind of learned what the deer were doing uh even though not that specific deer uh kind of had gained a lot of intel on it and i said okay I know the kind of stuff they like to be in. I know the kind of stuff that some guys, that most guys going in. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, I got you. Okay. And, uh, I'll let you know if you cut out. I made what I was, was calling like my five day plan to locate a new buck. Uh, in five days, I was going to check five areas uh, that I was pretty confident should be holding one. And day two, I got eyes on this deer for the first time. So what's your, what's your process when you're going through that five day plan? Are you mostly glassing? Are you doing a mixture of that and boots on the ground? Like what does your day look like when you're eliminating one area? Pretty good mixture of boots on the ground and scouting. Uh, during the, so what I was kind of doing was going in around three, four hours before dark, probably four hours before dark, hanging a stand uh, and getting as high as I could and glassing an area of like bedding areas or stuff coming out of bedding areas and uh, sit it that evening, leave, come back and give it one more chance that morning. If I didn't see a shooter, take down, scout the edges of food sources during the middle of the day and by you know, two thirty, three o'clock that each afternoon have the stand hung ready for the next two sits, just trying to observe. Uh, so are these areas, I, I don't want to reveal much about your property that you're on here, but are you often finding when you're on these out of state trips that, and, and this is something I've kind of pulled from Andy may, but I'm not good at it by any means at all, but I know Andy is really successful at glassing in areas that he has to access a long way or has to get in a tree and can't see from the road. Is that typically the way that you are locating a deer that you think you can target or at least for your afternoon mm, sits? Cause... That's kind of sort of. So what, what a lot of these guys were doing was going as deep as they could. Uh, actually in the time I hunted this deer, I had five guys walk under my tree. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't, very far where this deer was it was you know a lot of guys were passing it uh that's cool so normally so, so like back here yes my my strategy is to get as far and get to the most unbothered deer that we can possibly get to but you know we got six thousand continuous acres that don't have a road going through them uh yeah yeah you know up there it, it's like a lot of the midwest type of stuff you know 
not dealing with huge pieces of property and there's a lot of roads. Uh, yep. And there were a lot of people. So I kind of just, I was trying to just think outside the box as much as I could. I like that. Yeah. So, so then you laid eyes, eyes on this deer before you decided to go into that area or were you in that area when you first laid eyes on this deer? This deer? I was, I was in that area when I first laid eyes on the deer. Okay. Uh, do you think there was any way that you could have sat back further and seen him and then decided to go in? No, there was trees. That's really what I wanted to, that, it yeah, was, that's what I wanted to get to for our listeners here too. Cause sometimes you, you got to go in on faith and understanding and then, you know, that that's when you stand to discover what you're really looking for. And then you can make an educated move from there. Um, and, and in some situations you can sit back, you can glass one from the food source, get a little bit closer, glass him again or something like that. Um, and sometimes you got the shot that you saw him and then he's never going to be there again. Yeah. So, um, it, it, it was kind of, to be honest with you, it was a small bedding area. It wasn't very big. Uh, I'm not going to say the size of it. Yeah. Don't give but, away anymore. Don't but, anymore. Uh, but it sounds I, like I, you, you it, I could get up in one spot and, and see the majority of the bedding area. If, yeah. if that makes any sense. Yeah. And, and it sounds like you, you assess the situation for what you had already known, but kept an open mind to the point that you could learn from what you were yet to find out. And I think yeah. a lot of people get so used to hunting a specific strategy that they can't apply another strategy to a situation when it calls for it because they're so fixed on using a certain strategy that they don't even consider that another one might be the one to get it done. So um, it's really cool to see that, you know, in the experience you have, you've taken advantage of what you know for certain, but kind of put yourself away from your preconceived notions where you're allowed to learn from what's in front of you and what the deer are really doing. Uh, it, it looks like you're putting yourself in situations to do this over and over again. I mean, people don't get on the buck that you did a lot of times in a lifetime, let alone a buck that was bigger than it the week before. And, you know, so like, I think that's a testament for folks listening to uh, maybe get a little tactical here, but um, make sure that you're really writing down and understanding what you know for a fact and never be afraid to remove yourself from stuff that, you know, if conditions change, you got to adapt to it. So I love that, man. But, but you laid eyes on this deer, right? And he's, he's, uh, is he coming into or exiting that bedding area at this point? So the, the crop fields were covered up and what these deer were doing were really, they were making a loop in this bedding area. Uh, they had certain places where there were different plants growing that they were eating and there was a water hole in the bedding area that they would hit. So they would kind of in the daylight, I mean, they were getting up two hours before daylight and mm -hmm. pretty much just hitting a big circle and every deer was doing it. I mean, obviously they weren't all just, you know, one behind the other, like railroad tracks riding around in a circle, mm -hmm. but they would bounce from one to another, to another. And then at very, very last light, you'd just see these, you'd see this buck just easing his way towards the crops. Uh, and I think probably 30 minutes after dark, he was making it out into the, out into the beans. Uh, wow. But until, you know, till it's black and white, he's staying in the bedding area. That makes sense. Yeah. And if they got that secondary food and, you know, they don't always need a bit of water because they get a lot of their, their water from the food they eat. But if they got water, you know, it's hot as hell out there. Like that, that makes a big difference. You know, he's not going to make it as far. I had a buck last night. Um, there's a, there's about a one fifties nine point that I am not really after, but, but would shoot. And, um, I'm waiting for number one to show up, but this nine is preceded by like a one ten ten point. And I was hunting after that nine and I would have shot him if he came out. But, um, it was about 30, 40 minutes before dark, and I hear both of them stand up. And I actually heard one of the bucks get like a fly in his nose and was just violently sneezing for like 20 seconds straight, um, trying to get this freaking bug out or fly out or whatever. And so they're in, they're in cattails mixed in with uh, tamaracks and a bunch of other cover. And it's it's 15-foot wall, you know. And so the 10-point 
is super slow and makes it like 50 yards in daylight, but he's browsing the whole way. And I'm, I'm just speaking in my mic and I'm like, I can tell these deer are browsing because they're taking like 10 steps and stopping and 10 steps and stopping. And they're not just smelling like they're not stopping in an opening. They're not just smelling for danger or anything like they're, they're eating. And so they're, they want to go to Oaks, right? They, they want to go to just rain and white Oaks right now. And they're, you know, over a mile from them. And <laughs> Despite all that, they browsed. The small buck came into range and made it 50 yards in daylight, and the big buck made it 20 yards in daylight. And that's like hearing them stand up. So, like, when deer are in this situation, you know, it depends where you're at and what they're what they're browsing around. But you might, I mean, it's a good thing that you're able to see them right as they were exiting that bedding and that they're doing it a little bit before light at times because, like, you just expressed when you're in tall cover like that, like they could just stand up and they could be active for four hours before dark, but you're not going to see them and you're not going to get close enough to even hear them do that 90% of the time. Yeah. And that, that's pretty well what they were doing. Uh, they would get up and they would bed shift kind of throughout the middle of the day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and they would feed. But when I say they would feed, I mean, they had a, up until 30 minutes before daylight or even a little less, uh, they had a 15 yard bubble that they would stand around and, you know, walk around in circles in. And it also, I want, I want to point this out too. Uh, it was not a specific bed. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they were, they were coming into the bedding area and pretty much making that loop and wherever they were when the sun came up, uh, they were bedding down and wherever, whatever those three points were that they were hitting in that bedding area, whatever they were closest to, they were hitting before dark. Uh, yeah. But they were in the bedding area way before dark or way before daylight and, you know, staying in there a good bit after dark. Hey guys, Rick here from the Mobile Hunter Podcast, and I'm here to tell you about one of our sponsors, Saddies LLC, Custom Ammunition and Gun Works. Aaron Satterfield and his family have been turning out some awesome game loads that have been putting down deer, waterfowl, and turkey all year long. The Saddies Fatty, the turkey load that we use, can stop a bird dead in its tracks. Check them out at saddiesllc.com. That's S-A-T-T-I-E-S-L-L-C.com. Or on Facebook at Saddies LLC and tell them the Mobile Hunter Podcast sent you. A good bit after dark. Yeah, I like that. That's a, that's a good thing to point out, too. I mean, I think that was a little bit of a misconception at first when a lot of this bed hunting stuff came out is that they're using the same bed. Uh, they're often occasionally even using the same bedding area, and that area can be 300 yards wide at times. Um, you know, yeah. I, th I feel like in the cases you stand to succeed on a pinpoint setup, they're a bit smaller, but, you know, you hunt for those cases rather than, you know. It, it, it's cool if they're in a bedding area, but if they're in a bedding area that's 300 yards wide, it's so often doesn't do you much good with a bow in your hands, but no, it does. Um, that's awesome, man. So you relocated this deer and you're starting to figure out what he's doing. Um, how many days did you observe him doing this? Did you go in right away on the first day or what was your plan here? Uh, so there wasn't a whole lot of adjusting that I really had to do when I figured out what they did. Uh, so pretty much when I realized what those three points were, they were hitting, I had a great wind and a bulletproof access to one of the three places. Uh, nice. Kind of access where as long as your wind's good, you can hunt it day in and day out. Uh, I had seven days with the right wind. And I, I mean, I pretty much said after like, you know, the second day. And it was, it was the watering hole is what I could sit. Uh, I said, if I just sit here with the right wind, with the way that this access is, I mean, I can sit it day and day and day, and one day they're going to be bedded close enough for me to get a shot. So at that point, I just decided, I mean, I decided not to hunt them in the mornings because they weren't moving very much in the mornings, and I didn't want to, you know, affect their, their bedding in any way. Uh, but pretty much from, I decided from about 10 or 11 o'clock till dark, I was going to sit there until he was dead. Uh, and it just so happened on day three of me knowing about the deer, he was bedded at 80 yards from where I was set up at. Nice, dude. Wow, that's and that's different, too, because, like, a lot of times in that open country, like I was hunting, when it's really hot out, they move more in the mornings because it's been cooling down all night, and it's really cool. 
Um, and then they move very little in the afternoon. Um, but again, like you don't know until you go into the situation, figure it out for yourself. And I like that you, a lot of guys are like, Oh, I want to see it twice. And I want to see it three times. And then I go after it. And it's like, that's just not, I mean, I, I don't like that, but, (laughs) but I'm glad that you you public land that's that pressured. I mean, I'm not like, I'm not like a go get aggressive and and screw it up kind of guy. But when you, when you get an opportunity, you gotta, you gotta get, get it done. Uh, yeah, you, you can only sit back and wait so long. So, I mean, you've got to be strategic in what you do, but if you want to watch that deer four or five days, I mean, in those, in those three days, I had five guys walk under my stand and I had three guys walk in from the opposite side of the bedding area. It's only a matter of time till, you know, somebody busts through there. And I mean, deer could be comfortable enough to stay, but more than likely gigs up. Yeah. And, yeah, it's only a matter of time until people get in there and bust it out. There's so much that's out of your control on public land, you know, and you don't want to be relying on it staying like a, a, a sacred. You're good. Yeah, I got you. And you don't want to rely on it being like a sacred, like refuge or anything like that for, for forever. You know, and I especially with historical intel, I'll get on the soap, soapbox really quick. But like you hear a lot of guys being like, all right, I see a buck do this on October 18th this year. And then I watched him do it next year, and I watched him do it the year after. So now I'm going to go after him. It's like, dude, if you would have just went on faith of what you saw the first year, you would have killed that deer, you know, the next year. Yeah. So like, I I like that you assessed your setup. You determined how repeatable it was, and you're like, all right, like, what are the variables at play? How am I going to get this deer killed? How many shots do I got? You know, and now I'm going to execute, and I'm going to I'm going to trust in my skill. I'm going to trust in what I learn. And I'm going to go make this happen. So um, let's just, I mean, let's not talk about the nature of your access too, because I don't want to give away your spot, but um, because I I personally know nothing about how you got in there, but I don't want to go into that because that's often how people find stuff. But you get in your tree, right? What time are you getting in? Let's, Let's start at just like what time you got in your tree, what you were feeling and what you saw throughout that day and just lead us right into the story of you, you know, recovering this deer at the end. So... I was going to get in my tree at about 11 o'clock and I actually ran into the guy that take the, took the pictures of the deer with me. Uh, Jack Jackson Smith from, uh, he does some videoing and stuff from Midwest whitetail. And we actually stood out there and talked for, for a while and, uh, just kind of hung out. So I ended up getting in my tree the day that I killed him about 1245. Uh, okay. at, and it was, it was hot that day, so I knew, you know, that they would probably, at least deer in general, would be wanting to wanting to drink something at some point. Well, what I didn't expect was at one fifteen, a doe came and drank some water out of that little watering hole, and as she goes to leave, she walks up on the deer, and he stands up at one fifteen oh. <laughs> at, at eighty. Oh. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So, I mean, I, I pretty much got in the stand and immediately I was like, Oh crap, he's here. Like today, today's the day that I thought I was going to have to wait <laughs> a lot of days for. Yeah. Uh, wow. So once, I mean, he stands up and he looks around and I don't know that he was originally planning on, you know, moving or anything, but he stands up, looks around for a minute and eases uh, 10 yards towards me and beds down again. So now he's at 70. Uh, wow. He, he lays there for about 30, 45 minutes, stands up again, and eases another 10 yards towards me. Uh, so are you are you standing at this point like bow in hand, thinking just any second now? Yeah. Like, okay, so you, so when he comes in and beds down at 60, uh, so the deer had a running buddy, and his running buddy was bedded on the opposite side of the watering hole. And this deer was kind of off the corner, and if he skirted the back edge, he was going to get at 70, and that would be the next closest that I got to him. And he was at 60, and if he came towards me, he would end up at 30 yards. Uh, so what I actually did, I had a good shooting lane, but if I could have been about three foot lower, I would have had a better shooting lane. So when he bedded down, and I knew where that other buck was, and they, I mean, it was 50-50 on where they would go. Uh I actually dropped my tether down a little bit and I got down on the limbs below me and uh, yes, bow in hand waiting. Uh, wow. 
and sat That's there. That's some ballsy stuff, dude. What kind of pound rating you got on your freaking tether, man, with those balls you got <laughs> with those bucks in range? Holy crap. Well, that is cool, man. He he was asleep, so it I mean I, I knew I knew it was risky, but I was also uh I was six sticks with two two step eighters up, so I knew I could get away with a little Holy bit of crap. Dude, you're sky high. Holy crap. No wonder you can see these deer in this cover from so far away. I mean that that's, that's the only way it's doable. Uh yeah. That's the only oh, that's way cool. it's doable. So yeah. Uh, Man, so he, he gets up and beds down at 60. You slide your tether down and you get in position. Are you, you said you're standing on limbs of a tree right now? Yes. So I, <laughs> oh, I, knew, that's cool. I knew there was a chance for a long shot. So I kind of braced up. I had my tether up, you know, kind of pushing against the limb right above me. And I have one of my knees kind of dug into the tree. And then I have my right leg, uh, you know, on the limb. So, I mean, I was trying to be as steady as possible because I wasn't sure how far this mm-hmm. shot was about to be. Mm-hmm. So, wow. that's cool. Uh, he then stands up and his running buddy stands up. I mean, he just stands up, kind of looks around, his running buddy stands up. And he actually, the running buddy starts working towards that secondary food source that was in the bedding. And the deer I killed was facing me and he turned, you know, just based off his body language, I was like, okay, he's. This is it. Uh, and I had drawn back on him twice the night before. And mm. I, I told myself, if he gets under 70, he's not walking away again. Uh, so he, he was at 64 yards and started trying to walk away. And I drew back and stopped him. Oh, my God. So, I mean, you, you have to be. I think you're like me. You're probably telling yourself, like, this deer is dead. Like you're, you're in the zone right now. Like you're, there's not a shot you're not making at this point. Yeah. I was, I was pretty bad locked in. I mean, I was, yeah, he he had to go. (laughs) Yeah. I like that, man. So, I mean, just run me through the shot execution, man. What happened? You're at full draw. You're on him at 64. He stopped. So I can just tell you the whole story about this right here, because this is where it really gets interesting. Um, Mm -hmm. So I draw back and shoot and I can't, he's in grass where he is standing at. That is probably close to chest high on us. Mm, No, that's a lot. He had matted down where he was laying at. So I could see like his vitals and up. So I put my pen right where the grass hits his vitals and, uh, or where it ends at. So I shoot. And man, it feels like three days. I mean, that air is just in the air, in the air, in the air. And then when it gets in front of his body, like dropped down to where his body was in the background, I lost it. I mean, I had no idea where I hit him at. Uh, so you, you basically, you know that you're going to go right over these tips of grass because they're in front of your pin, right? So like yes. you're going to go elevated above this grass and land right in the zone. But the second you hit that zone, it's going to be back at grass level. So you'll have, you'll have tucked into his bed not hitting cover and have gone into that deer, but you're going to lose it once it touches that deer. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I had no idea where I hit him. I I knew I, I knew I hit him pretty good because I heard it. Uh, I mean, you know, when you, when you hit him in that chest cavity, it's different. Uh, the sound is different. Uh, so the deer, he kind of dropped when I shot, he kicks and he runs probably 70 yards and it's kind of leaning back and forth doing that, that death rock. And, uh, I was like, okay, I need to get my binos on him. So when he goes down, I can, I can see what hat, where he's at. Exactly. Grab my binoculars, look up, he's gone. Uh, <laughs> that's how it always goes, man. So he was butted up to, uh, some taller stuff that I couldn't see into. So I knew he either fell where he was or he went into the, the tall stuff and uh gave him two hours and get down I, I was actually i was on the phone with my dad i mean i was freaking out i i mean i knew he was big and uh said i'm gonna just go check for blood and if uh if it looks good i'll go track him if not i'll back out give him you know till tonight because i shot him at 305 so i would have liked to try to get you know get on the blood and find it while it was daylight 
Uh, mm -hmm. So I find the or I don't find the arrow. I find the blood, and uh, I mean he's dumping. He was bleeding everywhere. So I was like, I'm going to get him. So uh, real quick, what kind of broadhead are you using? Rage hypodermic. Okay. Okay. And I'm assuming you practice a lot at these ranges. Yes. Specifically for this trip, uh, because I knew the reality of what, you know, I might be taking shots at, uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, just what the situations were. So I yeah. was, I was practicing, I was trying to practice and it's not like I was real good at this distance, but I was just trying to make 60 seem closer. I was practicing at like 90 just to make mm -hmm. 60 not seem so far. Uh, and, and it's really like your, your mistakes are elevated. Like yeah. your, your one inch miss at 60 is now a four inch miss, you know? Yeah. So like you, you can work very, very strategically on your form when you're yeah. shooting further than the range you plan on shooting at. It's not that you practice exactly for the range you're shooting, but you practice to be much further honed in by the time yeah. you reduce that range. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I mean, people will be like, why are you shooting at 90? You'll never, but exactly what you just said. I mean, and that's kind of something I've always done, even when I was in high school and stuff. If I was, I mean, to be good at 20, I'd try to practice at 40 just because yeah. – it makes, like you said, it makes your mistakes. If you can be good at 40, you can be real good at 20. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's where I'm at too, man. Like I, last year I was practicing at 70, 80 yards very consistently and I was able to shoot 60, but this year I've been so busy during the summer. Like I've been practicing a lot at 60, but I haven't been pushing it back. So like 40 is like my limit, you know, this year. Cause I, you know, it is kind of like riding a bike, but it's also like you, you need to be confident. Right. And for me, if I feel, and I hold myself to a very high standard, but if I feel like I didn't put the work in, I know how I'm going to feel in the moment of that shot. I'm going to feel unprepared and yeah. something's going to go south. So like, you know, that policy is something that also not only helps you work on what, what's going wrong, but gives you a lot of confidence in your ability to shoot those closer ranges. And, and you're going to be better at it through and through. I mean, I got some buddies that, uh, Ethan Eskew, for example, he's awesome archer. He shot a lot of competition archery. Um, you know, really, really hardworking dude, practices all the time. And he, he, he'll he shoot bucks at, he shot bucks at 80 yards, but he routinely practices 100, 120 yards. Um, and it's just, and, and he's a big preacher of, of having a mechanical head, uh, not because, like, like obviously you're, you get your arrows tuned, your bow tuned, like you should be shooting straight with uh, any broadhead, but there's the factor of crosswinds and stuff like that, lower profile, catches less wind, um, so, you know, anyone shooting at further ranges, he's, you know, at, I'm not at the point I'm shooting that far yet, but he is recommended to me using a, a mechanical for those purposes. And, um, there's also the threshold of about 50 yards where that sound is dissipated a decent amount by the time it gets to that deer. And they tend to react less than, you know, like 40 and in, uh, you know, 40, 30 yards are reacting pretty dang good. It might be an easier shot for you to hit a mark that that uncertainty is a lot higher while the arrows in the in the air a lot a little bit longer at 60 than it is at 40 uh you can be a little more certain the deer is not reacting as much to your shot because that sound dissipates quite a bit you know especially when you consider the other factors going on but that's all like theories in my head but but i know a lot of guys that shoot very ethical shots at far distances and i know a lot of guys that shoot unethical shots at close distances you know and and so anyone can cast judgment about whatever shot you take at a white tail, but until you're in that situation and you've done the work, you know, I would say <laughs> your opinion doesn't mean squad. I mean, I, I, I'd take that shot that you just took at 64 over plenty of the shots that I've taken at 30, you know? Yeah. And, and but, that's it, 60 plus is not normal for me either. I mean, where I live at, there's not, I mean, I told you oh, how yeah. big, I told you how big the public land is on the place I hunt. And I don't know that there's mm -hmm. hardly a field on the whole whole thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, most of my deer that I'm killing here are, you know, between 20 and 30. Uh, and it's it's the same in Wisconsin, man. Like, you can't get that high in a tree because the trees just aren't that that big in the marshes. And you're in 10-foot tall cover. So, so often you're shooting at steep angles and stuff to even get in there. Or you're in the little gap in the cover. Yeah. Um, and when I, I want to clarify to the listeners – when I said I'd take that shot at 64 rather than some of the shots I've taken at, at 30, what I'm saying is I think that 
you are being more ethical at 64 than some of the shots I've taken with hard angles at 30 when I was younger. Um, you know, I've made less responsible shots at closer ranges. So range isn't everything. Um, and if I, if I know you well, Drake, I know that you prepare your ass off. So, you know, hearing that out of your mouth, man, like I'm, I'm a hundred percent confident that you were prepared to take that shot and the mental lock in being in that situation, watching that deer's behavior for days and then hours beforehand, I feel like you have a really good feel for what's going on in that situation far more than some of the other situations I've been in that have been at half that range. So, um, I, I, anyone listening to this, I would not question your ethics in any way. Uh, and, and proof be told, let's, we'll go back to the story. I mean, so he's gushing blood at this point. What are you thinking as you're following that trail? Thinking it's over. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I get to where he went in, uh, to that thick stuff. What, what he actually went into was some cattails. And, uh, mm. I know that you've shot deer and cattails and you know what it looks like when they pummel through that stuff. Uh, yeah. and you know, there's blood all over them. Well, I'm like, okay, I, I kind of thought for a second, I was like, I don't know, maybe I should back out and just give them a little more time just cause I didn't know where it hit, but there was so much blood. I was like, you know, he, I'm going to get him. Uh, mm -hmm. so I start easing through this cat, through these cattails down this trail, bloods everywhere. Uh, and I get to where I could see him at probably five yards. And I kind of eased around and I could see his legs out and his head down like he's dead. And I was like, okay, well, here it is. I kept an arrow knocked and I kept my release on while I was trailing. Uh, I get to where I could probably reach out and poke this deer with my arrow and he looks up at me and takes out. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> So, uh, I proceed to take out like Rambo through these cattails and, uh, I'm running behind him and he finally gets out of them and where I could see the opening in the cattails. So I knew I kind of needed to be easy taking those last couple steps. I peek out and he's at 15, just stopped looking around. Uh, so I draw my bow back, step out and he's quartered to me hard. But at this point I'm just trying to get more arrows in him. Uh, mm -hmm. I, sh I, I get on him and I shoot him. Uh, that arrow ended up going into that femoral artery that's kind of on that back side. Uh, yeah, like right below the back strap. Yes, yes. Uh, okay. He bounces another five yards and stops and is still facing away from me. And so I'm, I'm I mean, I'm, I'm going to keep shooting. If yeah, yeah. Let me say that if anybody ever has a chance to get another arrow in a deer that is shot. You keep shoot. I mean, yeah, I do. I'm I'm shooting till I run out of arrows because, I mean, every shot's just is is he's dying quicker. It's yeah, it's more ethical. It's better on you mm -hmm. all around. And I will say, like, there's there's situations I've seen where people are like, man, if I didn't put that other shot in the deer, it wouldn't have ran forever, and I wouldn't have had such a hard track, or maybe it would have died on the spot. I don't really think that's like super the case and i've seen shots there's one posted on the mobile hunter facebook page the other day uh just textbook looking you know just outside the vital v a little back from that like perfect perfect looking shot right and the thing is once that arrow breaks that skin you don't know what kind of deflection it goes on or what happens after that like there's a lot of unpredictability with deer in general let alone once an arrow impacts them too so like I like that policy of, of put another arrow in and get some more hole, get some more blood flowing, get some more oxygen leaving that body. Yeah. Yeah. It's cause once he's, once he's already shot, you want, you don't want the deer to suffer. I mean, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, and sorry, you kind of cut out through some of that. I, I lost some of that, but, uh, you're good. Yeah. I, you're good. Just, just keep going. We, we, we pretty much cover where we're at at this point. Yeah. So, so I shoot him again, uh, kind of in the back, all I could see was his head up or mid neck and up, uh, in that thick stuff. And I shot him again in the neck, uh, took off into the next batch of cattails and I backed out. Uh, he ended up not going 10 more yards. Uh, I had a local guy that I, I have met me and him have become pretty good friends and, uh, text him, told him that, I shot one and, uh, he ended up going in there and helping me get it. 
So <laughs> cool, man. So you were probably like, all right, well, let's get ready for this track. And then 10 yards from where you last saw him. That's what were the emotions I, like, man, walking up on that deer? Dude, the, not only the walking up on the deer, it's the, the whole hunt, man, is just, uh, like every high and every low that a hunter can encounter those yeah. 10 or 11 days were like the extremes of both. Uh, actually I, when I, so when I actually left my house, uh, to come up there, I, A, I knew I wanted to be locked in and B, I mean, I've, just, I've had a lot going on. Uh, it's been a crazy year. It's been a really hard year. Uh, I was like, man, I'm getting off everything and I'm going to bring my hunting stuff. I'm going to bring my Bible and I'm going to hunt. And when I'm not hunting, I'm going to be reading my Bible and praying and getting close to the Lord. And when I'm not doing that, I'm going to be finding the biggest deer I can find. Uh, got off all social media. And so, I mean, I was really, really locked in. Uh, losing the deer that I originally come up there to hunt, like, and just the, I mean, it's hard to explain it for anybody that hasn't been freaking out trying to find a deer like that. I mean, I was just beat to death. And the day that I decided, like, I've got to let it go, I mean, I felt like, what am I even going to do? Uh, mm -hmm. Finally find that deer, get on him. I feel back kind of in my groove, get a shot, and I'm, you know, back at the highest high. And then watching that deer run off, man, it was just pandemonium. Yeah. Like it was pandemonium. And I mean, I was like, I was calling my buddies. I was calling my dad. I was calling everybody like, what do y'all think? Should I even give this deer? Like, should we wait till the morning? Should I, you know, blah, blah, blah. And everybody's like, you have put three arrows in that deer. He's dead. Uh, so yeah, we went and got back on the blood and literally 10 seconds into the track from where we last saw him. I mean, just dude, it was awesome. I mean, there's nothing. Dude. There's not a feeling like it there. And that's, I mean, that feeling is what, I mean, it's what I live for. It's what drives me every day. There's nothing, there's nothing that does something to me like what that does. Um, yeah. Having the lows with it just makes it so much better. Honestly, in my opinion. Yeah. It was a lot of work and a lot of prayer went into that deer in a matter of a few days and finally getting to put your hands on him is just, I don't know. There's not that. Uh, I'd like to tell you how I felt, but I, I'm having a hard time. Yeah. No, I, I, I personally have a, a little bit of a feel how you felt, man. I had that, that giant six by six, just clean freaking, you know, giant of a buck, uh, that was chasing all year last year. And I went to Ohio and on my drive back, got told, like got sent a Facebook picture of someone else holding them in his hands. And, um, yeah, that, that crushed me and I had three days left to hunt and ended up getting a good buck that I got behind me right now over my, my shoulder here. Um, and dude, that feeling of redemption is, is crazy. And yeah, a lot of praying going into it too, but I feel like the prayers get answered with challenge. Like the prayers get answered, not with, you know, you're not, you're probably like me where you're not praying to get another buck. You're, you're praying for you to find the skill and to find the wisdom and to find the desire that God put within you and everything that God has already given you. And you're, you're praying for God to not give you an opportunity, but allow you to, um, allow you to succeed. Like, you know, when you, when you pray for, when you pray for strength, I feel like God is more inclined to give you an opportunity to be strong. And when you pray for courage, I feel like, you know, this is, lines that everyone's heard before, but I feel like God is going to give you an opportunity to be courageous. And, you know, when you pray for success, he's going to give you the opportunity to give up. And when you push through and you find that success yourself, I feel like that's where that feeling of reward comes through. Cause it's something that transcends you. It's, it's deeper than you just killed the deer. Like you just renewed part of your soul is what it feels like, you know? And that is, I mean, I feel like that's why it's so undescribable is because there's something a little more at work than just the things that we understand by our own means. And it just seems like 
that's the story of a lifetime. And if I know you, you're going to have a lot more of them. Um, but dude, I'm just, I'm freaking Jack free, man. What a crazy cool story, man. I, I appreciate it. It was, uh, I've looked for a long time and never come across. I mean, this is the, the biggest deer I've ever hunted. And I mean, just, I don't know, man, it's crazy. That's awesome. It yeah. It's so surreal. Hey man, you, I know you, you, in a week you're going to be like, all right, where's the next one? Like, you're going to be appreciative of that memory, but you're like, all right, we got to move on. We got to get some more killing in. Um, October but just to talk Alabama. I know, man, I'm, I'm, I'm hyped for you too. And I know that's the home state too. So you're going to be on some, you're on some freaking studs. I'm sure. Um, what, where did that initial shot hit by the way? Where did your first shot hit? So he dug the arrow. It went in probably mm. six inches high, but with the angle of me being up above him, the way I was, it came out between his two front legs. Uh, Oh, it caught a single lung, and I think he laid down to die, but you know how those single lung shots are crazy. I mean, sometimes they'll die yeah. an hour, and sometimes they'll live for two days. Uh, yeah, it's a good thing you went after him then. Yeah. I I don't know what would have happened if I wouldn't have, you know, got more errors in him. He probably would have made it a long way. He probably would have had to call a dog. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, God, I'm very thankful that I got an opportunity to, to just keep shooting him because – there's no telling how it would have ended up. The stuff he could have got into had he kept running wouldn't have been wouldn't have been real good. Yeah, and and you're operating on that instinct, man. I feel like you can't go wrong because you operate on instinct, and if your instinct's wrong, you are the one that you're the one that produced that failure, and you're the one that can learn from it. You know exactly what went wrong because that that deer bumping is gonna show you immediately what happens. And, um, you know, it's calculated aggression, but when you think about it for a long time and you make a decision, even if it ends up wrong, you learning from that something you're never going to forget. And so, and if it goes right, it goes right. You know, you shoot the deer again, you get some more arrows in them, you, you recover them. We, we're here there. We're here now. Like we, we know yeah. it was freaking awesome if, if it goes right, but if it goes wrong, like that's a lesson you're never forgetting. So like you always stand to benefit by going off your instinct. Whereas if you go away from your instinct, you don't really get to learn from it and you don't really get to develop more confidence in your own skills. So dude, yeah, man, it has been, <laughs> what a great story. It's been an honor having you on. It's been an honor personally to get to know you, um, over just the past few months. I mean, it really hasn't been long, uh, that we've gotten to know each other. And, um, besides this deer, like, like really excited to hear everything that goes on in your life, dude, and stay in touch. Um, and I know I've said that off the mic too, but this isn't one of those situations that I've seen and heard from plenty of podcast hosts that want to say they've talked to a guy and they like him, And that's why they're, you know, your open invite to come on whenever, like, like I, I care about you as a friend and I am just like, I'm almost emotional right now thinking about you killing this deer. I'm really, really, really happy for you. And it couldn't have happened to a more deserving guy, man. I'm, I'm super, super happy for you here. Man, I, I sure do appreciate it. It's Shoot, the honor's been mine, dude. I mean, we, you know, we met at that expo and we just clicked. Hell, we hang out, we hung out all night, and I mean, same mindset, same mentalities, ten states away. But yeah, that's the that's the beauty of deer hunting. Absolutely, man. That's what's that's the blessing about those expos, man. They bring a lot of people together that wouldn't get to know each other otherwise, too. And yeah, um, is there anywhere that you know? I love the getting off of the social media and stuff like that. And I'm due for some of that myself, but is there anywhere that I can direct people to maybe get a, you know, maybe in touch with you if they want to hear this story again, or maybe keep up with the adventures you're on. Cause man, I only see this healing going up from here for you. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm back on Instagram now. Uh, it was my, so I have like a hunting page that is underscore the white tail advantage. Um, okay. Yep. That's that's pretty much just my hunting stuff, you know, We'll post our kills and a few videos, whatever. But me and my brother are on it. And then uh, my personal page is just underscore Drake Deerman. Uh, either one of those. So Yeah, I can't. I mean, I forgot. I've seen your videos before. I forgot to introduce you with the Whitetail Advantage. But uh, great stuff on there, too. And, and it's happening from a place of passion and faith, too. I'll have to say, so if you're a guy that likes following along with someone that's doing it because they love it and just love sharing their experience and someone that, uh, you know, 
resembles God in their faith in every area of their life, and especially in the outdoors, uh, give them a follow, give them a subscribe, and and you know check that out. And dude, I'm I'm just excited to see everything you do in the future here, man. It's been great to have you on. Thank you for for telling the story. Man, I sure do appreciate it. Y'all, uh, y'all just opened up too, didn't you? Yep, yep. We we opened up on the fourteenth. Um, I have been doing a lot of editing, so I've only gone out for two <laughs> hunts. Um, but yeah, we opened on the fourteenth, man. I'm super, super excited. I spent a week in Nebraska at uh, starting on the first, but man, there's there's some special stuff going on in Wisconsin that hopefully I get to get to hold up for you guys this year, brother. I hope you kill every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. I hope so, too. It'll be a tall task to get any one of them. But, you know, either way, I'll, I'll be enjoying my time out there and earning it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it, man. Yeah. Well, you have a great night, Drake. Thank you so much for being on here. Yes, sir. You, too. Thank you, man. Thanks for tuning in to this week's podcast. The best way you can support the podcast is by sharing online and with your buddies at Deer Camp. Please follow us on Facebook and Instagram and leave us a five-star review.